Hey guys and welcome back. I've got a heap more progress to share so let's get straight into it. This video was sponsored by PCBWay. To begin with, I needed to finish making the parts for the triggers so I could test them and confirm that I'm happy with the design. These are the final parts of the acrylic housing, the trigger supports. These bolt to the brass inserts on the inside of the rear grip sections and provide a pivot point for the triggers as well as help separate the shoulder and trigger buttons. They are quite a small part so I've just held them down with the tape and glue method and I have some clamps holding the stock down to begin with. The 4mm end mill makes quick work of removing the bulk of the material. I then drilled the 2mm holes for the mounting screws and a 1mm hole for a bit of spring wire for the trigger springs before doing the final cut around the outside with the 4mm end mill. These parts need some manual processing afterwards. I need to countersink the mounting holes from underneath for the M2 countersunk screws and then I need to carefully measure, mark and drill the hole for the pivot pin for the triggers. Next up, I'll make the triggers. The plan is to eventually cast these from polyurethane resin like the rest of the buttons, but I've decided to do a whole episode on the buttons and silicon parts, so for now, I will just 3D print these so I can get on with testing. For the triggers to work properly, I need some torsion springs. I've found a supplier of some suitable springs on AliExpress. They aren't going to be delivered until October sometime, so I've bought a bit of spring wire from my local hobby shop, and I'm going to make them myself for now. Using a vise and an allen key to wind the wire around, I was able to make a decent spring by hand. Now that everything is made, I can assemble the triggers and test how they feel. Unfortunately, I stuffed up and I ordered 5 volt Hall effect sensors rather than 3.3 volt and I've been unable to find any locally. So we will have to wait until my next parts order turns up before I can verify that the position of the magnets and sensors is suitable. Before I get started testing games, I have a brand new screen sitting here ready to be fitted. The original screen I bought has pretty awful viewing angles, and even when looking at it straight on, the colours aren't that great. The new screen is an IPS panel with a claimed 700 nits of brightness, so it should be substantially brighter and have much better viewing angles and colours than the old display. It's also 0.6 of a mil thinner, which means we'll have a lot more wiggle room inside too. I won't bore you with the whole fitting process, so let's just look at a before and after. Here's some footage with the old display. As you can see, the colours are pretty washed out, and the screen quickly disappears as the camera goes off angle. And here it is with the new IPS LCD panel. As you can see, the colours are much nicer, and the viewing angles are much greater than they were before. This should make it much more enjoyable to look at. I don't have the equipment to test the brightness levels, but it is definitely a bit brighter than the last one, so I'm happy enough with that. Now that all the acrylic bits have been made and test fitted, I decided it's finally time to get some paint on it. I've found that the Tamiya polycarbonate spray paints stick really well to acrylic, which means I've got loads of colours to choose from. I want to keep it translucent, but I'm painting it to block some of the light from the LEDs shining through the diffusers. I've been agonising over what colour I want to paint it, and it was a close tie between PS39 translucent light blue and PS31 Smoke, which should both still leave me with a semi-translucent finish, as long as I don't make it too thick of a coat. You've obviously seen the thumbnail, so you'll know what colour I ended up choosing. To prepare for painting, I've bead blasted the housing in order to try and remove as many of the machining marks on the inside as possible. I then wet sanded the outside with 1200 grit to give it a glossy smooth feel. I gave all of the parts a careful spray on the inside and then the outside and let them dry. There's no real need for clear coat as this paint is designed to etch itself into the plastic and I've found it's almost impossible to scratch. Now that everything is painted, I can start reassembling it with the new screen. I've been too busy with everything else since the last video so I've made no further progress on the next revision of the PCB designs, but the previous revision that PCBWay generously provided is still working well for now. Once the final revision of the controller boards is ready to go, I'll be setting them up with PCBWay for easy ordering. I'll also provide detailed documentation for the housing parts so you can have them machined or printed professionally if you wish. PCBWay have helped make this project possible, so make sure you check them out if you need any PCBs, 3D printing or machining completed. I have done some work on the joystick calibration sequence though. Here's how the process works. First, I open the controller's inbuilt menu. 
This stops all gamepad and mouse functionality until the menu is closed again, so you don't need to worry about interfering with whatever is running on the NUC at the time. Use the D-pad to select Calibrate and press A to begin. The screen now displays a prompt and asks you to ensure the joysticks are centered. Press A to continue. Now, move the joysticks in circles several times to their full extents and then press A to complete the calibration process. I'll eventually add in a calibration step for the triggers too, but there's no point until I have them installed and functional. Now that it's all back together, I really wanted to be able to take the protection film off the screen, as it's getting a bit scratched up from all the test fitting and work I've done on the project over the last few months. The touch screen is only plastic on the front though, and I'm a bit worried it will get scratched, so I decided I needed a screen protector for it. I didn't have any luck finding pre-made ones for the kids tablet that this touchscreen came from, so I looked into getting a custom one made. I sent details for the size I needed to a company called ScreenShield, who quickly replied letting me know that they'd seen the videos and they would love to make a screen protector for this project. This screen protector is made from their nano glass and has a scratch resistance rating of 9H, which should provide excellent protection for the screen. I'll include details for the screen protector with the rest of the files in case you want to have your own made. Their custom screen protectors start from 29 AUD, so make sure you check them out. Now it's all back together, let's test a few more games on the nice new screen. Starting off with Doom. This game was released in 2016, but it seems to be very well optimised for lower end hardware. I'm getting about 40 FPS with settings on low. But unlike a lot of other games, it feels buttery smooth even at that lower frame rate. The darker blacks of the new display has definitely made this one more enjoyable. Unfortunately, shoot is tied to the right trigger button and there's no easy way to change that, so for now, I can only melee. I've never actually played Doom before this, so I'll need to put some hours in once I have the triggers done, because it seems like a pretty good game. I knew at least someone would ask, so here's a bit of Crisis. This game was released way back in 2008 and was an absolute nightmare to run for most average hardware at the time. It really is an impressive looking game compared to most from the same era. Even though this game is 8 years older than the version of Doom that we just tested, it just isn't running very well. As soon as there's enemies on screen, it becomes pretty much unplayable. I'm playing on a keyboard for this one since the game only supports Xbox controllers. There are workarounds for this, but it's not worth the hassle since it's really not worth playing on this device. Next up, here's Tomb Raider from 2013. This one runs beautifully at the native screen resolution with settings cranked all the way up. This is definitely a well-optimized game. Now that I've test fitted the triggers, I am confident enough to start releasing parts of the project. I will leave the trigger buttons themselves out for now until I have hall sensors here that I can test them with to ensure the magnets are in the correct place. I've set up a GitHub page and I've started uploading files. So far I've got 3D model files uploaded both in STEP and STL format and I've completed a basic assembly document to illustrate how all of the parts go together. I've included two different versions of the housing one as you've seen in the videos, and one without the RGB joystick surrounds, which should make it a little easier to print, or if you're too good for RGB. There's two different versions of the buttons too, one for clicky tactile switches and one for switches with rubber membranes. I've got a complete list up on the GitHub of everything you'll need to buy besides the components to populate the PCBs. I've included links for the ones I bought and enough information that you should be able to pick your own if you don't like the options I chose. I've also included a sizing test piece that I recommend you print first before you begin making parts. It is a frame that should fit the touchscreen glass snugly. If it does not, you will need to adjust scaling settings in your printer software to make sure it all fits and keep those same settings whilst you print all the parts for the housing. My next step is to finalise the designs for the next batch of prototype controller PCBs so that I can get an order in and start testing. If the next batch proves successful, I will upload all of the files, a complete bill of materials for populating the PCBs, and the software for the controller. Once the controller PCBs are complete and all the files are live on GitHub, I will begin working on the charge circuit again. There's obviously still a bit more work to be done before the device is fully buildable, so if you value your time and money, I recommend you wait until mine is complete before you begin. I've included links to the GitHub, Discord, and the sponsors in the description so make sure you check them out. 
See you next time.